Welcome to the Going Green podcast. Today we're going to have a look at solar punk. Mm -hmm. We're going to look at probably, you know, what is it? And I, I suppose the other question is, can it actually save the planet? That's probably what we're trying to have a look at. So let's start off with a simple statement, really. So I'm going to ask Paul a very simple question. Paul, what is solar punk? Well, you'll probably get several definitions, and it was one of those odd things that the term was coined in 2008 uh, on some talking about, you know, the opposite of sort of cyberpunk in relation to, you know, good world instead of being this dark, dreary world of cyberpunk where it's all in technology, and who cares? Was could we not just, you know, do blues and greens? You know, make the world this blue and green world as opposed to this dark and dreary world. So you're looking for a nice, lush, green community, beautiful sort of green roofs, uh, either covered in solar panels or if you can't afford that, you, you can put your grass on there as well. You could have these lovely sort of airplanes, sorry, airships floating across, not using really much energy to get from A to B. You could live in a lovely world where everyone is kind and generous and loving and giving to everybody else. I said yes. I mean, it's it's one of those odd things where that it's not actually quite as utopian as you expect it and think it to be. Essentially, what it means is is to live um, in balance with the planet. You know, we, you know, it's not that you can't live. You know, but it's the silly things of such as you know you do put your you know put solar panels but if your solar panels aren't made uh you know from from the mining and the mining's not very eco-friendly then you can't have solar panels so you've got to work on sort of how do you extract the the metal and the resources from the ground more ecologically friendly yeah and I, yeah and i'm not saying you can't mine but it's sort of say you know could you not instead of just digging a big hole, could you not use a natural cave formation to start your mine and sort of use not natural defects of the rock, but sort of, you know, where there is a hole, you follow it as opposed to, you know, almost things being more like a river. You meander down the river. It chooses its path at least resistance. All right. Yeah. Okay. But what happens if my mine, where I want to go and get the materials, isn't anywhere near your caves. Look, as I said, this is a, a utopian view of it. It's not real. It, it's the realism isn't quite there, but it's the idea that sort of, well, yes, you could dig a hole in the ground. That's fine. But sort of, is there more way to do it more ecologically? Is there a way to sort of, you know, make it one balance instead of just basically, you know, you dig this hole, could you then backfill it or, could you turn it into a, a, a sort of a lake and then basically let nature reclaim it and then basically sort of do it as a, you know, a natural reservoir, you know, all these extra things that, you know, are new and haven't changed. You know, it's, it's not the problem of doing the mining, areas, but you've got to do it. The mining has to be done ecologically friendly. If it's not done that, then what's the point of having solar panels and doing things? Yeah, if your energy you're going to try and use to try and create these solar panels is going to be that destructive to the environment, then is it really doing it? Because the good you're going to get out isn't outweighing the bad that you're actually doing. Yeah. So yeah. Yeah. yeah so, so so solar punk in that reference is making sure that every step is I say good. It's more ecologically friendly. You know everything you do you know communities instead of having urban sprawls you know we're talking about sort of you know using you know instead of using like say pipes as in like sewer systems in relation to man-made pipes can't we not use as a normal stream you know it, it, it's it's utilizing and using nature but also in balance with nature that, that's the whole thing you know instead of building street lamps can we not just plant a tree and then mount the light to the tree you see it, it's yeah you know, there's your structure by the way 
at the end of the day, you've also got a street lamp. And it's doing those ideas as opposed to, you know, building regimented street lamps, sort of like planting the trees. And then, of course, well, then you've got less cars. Why not walk it, bicycle it, make uh, everything, you know, that way? So. All, all right. Yeah. I, I like the idea, I will be honest, of having a tree with a light hill on, on it to be sort of the street light. I, I think I could go with that one down, down my street. And I want to go and put a wind turbine outside. So you're suggesting I make it rather than out of various things. I make it out of wood. Maybe I can even recycle my alternator or whatever rather than using a, a new one. I could sort of no. recycle. Yeah, the, the answer is you're not, you're not quite there. You can't, it's not all about recycling and reusing an alternator. No, you can still use a nice new generator. It's that that generator is ecologically friendly in its construction. You know, your generator, you, do you need the big generator or can you use three small ones with three small turbines? Do you need a hogging great big one that sort of, you know, if you dig a hole for when you can just have a nice small row of them on a fence. You know, it, it's looking at those ideas as opposed to sort of the big destructive. So you're, you're thinking rather than me put in my wind turbine and lash it to the roof, that perhaps I have a nice piece of string and I have my wind turbine floating in a, a helium balloon above my house it doesn't have to be very high above my house either no, yeah. but it would then pick up all the wind above that uh i can see the council would love this uh but i can have my little balloon uh with my wind turbine probably it would be sensible to have my thing looking more like a, a barrage balloon with my my turbine inside because it'd be safer and uh, of course my turbine is going to be made of uh, wood yeah, make my blades out of different composite woods rather than because that would be eco friendly and trying to generate and make some of those things. So yeah, I I could go with my little balloon going above there, uh, the front of my house where it's got solar panels. Yeah, okay, I could leave that. The back, I could put a lawn. I just hit my microphone. Uh, I could put a, a lawn on the rear uh of the roof where yeah. it doesn't get the sun i can volunteer you to go out and mow it every now and but, again but the idea is in relation to going past all that is we've got currently let's say we've got concrete or asphalt roads right yeah now what's wrong with dirt roads or even better why not one we're not i'm not saying cobble roads i'm saying stone roads you know, could you not just use a hard surface like that instead of using the asphalt or the concrete? Yeah, there, there are roads like that. There are still some, in fact, even in central London, uh, there are some sort of cobbled sort of stone paths. Yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm happy with that. Yeah. It's, it's not so nice to run my car down, but then do I need a car? Well, this is the point I'm about to make was, the next thing is the reason we have concrete and asphalt roads is because technically cobblestones can't take the weight of the vehicles uh, on it, which is why, which is why concrete and asphalt do. But it's the idea now already of, but do we need such large vehicles? Oh, you know, do you want to travel the million of miles to get somewhere, get something, or could you just go round the corner? Yeah. Yeah. Well, that, that's that's all right, but then. Do we actually then use trains to still just, because that's an efficient way of actually moving all the infrastructure, all the stuff around. And we could use the trains to move all the stuff that we need around. Yeah, that would work. Some countries do that even more than we do. Uh, you were telling me about Sweden doing that with uh, the famous IKEA plant, which has also got a, a railway line right it. there exactly yeah and it's knowing that sort of using efficiency because how much space i say this does a uh a train depot use or a train terminal or a train 
uh, warehouse in relation, you know, right use compared to a lorry one? And the answer is it uses only 10% of the uh, land use. So therefore it's a more efficient use land use than the uh, truck depot. And you could use smaller stations rather than larger ones. So you don't have to build enormous train sort of yeah. loading bays, but you could actually have rather small little mini ones in different places. So you could have, and we saw advertised this, this week, rather than having a, a train moving something, we saw some little bogies. And you had this little bogey and you put onto two of these bogies one container and that was it and it was ai driven and it went to wherever you want to go and they can bandy together when they're going in sort of along the main route and then you have tiny little routes coming out to take it to wherever it wanted to go and then you still might have lorries for the last little bit but you could have the main arter arteries done like that and that would save a lot of energy. Yeah, there's a whole different problem with the the, the, the battery power bogies, but it's the same argument already for two things: battery powered cars and battery powered, I say trucks, but lorries and things, uh, and also buses. I, I get the feeling you're going to use the word battery power now is the problem. Correct. Batteries, you know, this, this huge, you know, all these lovely minerals and sort of chemicals and from the ground. But of course, in this solar punk world, you see, we have less of that. We have all the electricity generation by solar panels, wind, you know, wind turbines, right? So then you don't need the batteries. Ah, uh, you do. Oh, well, shh, we could, you know, just shush, shush you. We could just drive the things off like we do trains, just straight from that grid. And you might say, yeah, but what about generating that up power? And it's sort of, you know, do we store that power? And the answer is no, we don't store that power. We only use what we can get. Yeah, okay. Or the alternative is, do you store it in a different form, like hydrogen? Do you actually then create fuel cells? Now, I know hydrogen's got a real problem with storage, but this week in the, the blog, we've been looking at liquid ways of storing hydrogen, literally putting in the hydrogen to a carrier and then having that carrier release the hydrogen and not at temperature, but at room temperature or or less so you could actually make it fit into well actually they were looking at it fitting into a train and the reason was because of scale but give the thing a, a future and it might get small enough that it could actually fit into your car as well so you could still fill your car up with this inert liquid which carries hydrogen and then release the hydrogen from that and then get your hydrogen when you go back into the petrol station, which is now going to be called a hydrogen station. You dump your fuel, which is now empty of hydrogen, and fill it up again with hydrogen containing liquid. Yeah. That would be good. You see, no batteries involved. Yeah, exactly. That's, that's all good and nice, Andy. But I was more thinking of, you know, your barrage balloons actually being fuel. That's where your hydrogen's contained and basically that, that that's a good point except when i need the hydrogen i bring it down because the, there's less hydrogen in it and i start so my my thing now isn't up high and it's not now collecting look, any look, wind as, as, as i say yeah you know, this is a future problem not a current one so we so we'll have to work on it but it's envisioning but instead of having these separate uh, fuel system you know could you not combine the both you know, hydrogen's a gas hydrogen is something that can keep buoyancy of things in the air therefore could you not use that hydrogen storage to lift your um yeah propeller to you know, your turbine in the air to generate electricity and then when you need the hydrogen of course you can then use the power of things to power new hydrogen create new hydrogen where you plumb in the old hydrogen 
You see, it's it, that's the whole yeah, okay. solution. I, I, I can see this, yeah. This is making some sense. So let's suppose I want to run a data center. Now, my data center is going to obviously need an awful lot of power. So if I'm going to do that, then I want to power that by renewable sources. And how about taking it to somewhere like Iceland? And there is a company that does this. There's Vern Global, and it does have a data center, and it's got a large campus in Iceland powered by the renewable energy. Sounds good, but these things are going to give out a lot of heat. What are you going to do with that heat, Paul? Well, in the solar punk future, the idea is to actually take that heat, all that generated heat, and you could put it in a nice dome and this, you know, a glass dome, and then you could almost power a tropical, I don't want to say rainforest, but a tropical zone, and in this, you know, in this greenhouse that requires a high temperature, and also, you know, it silly things like high heat and humidity. And because, of course, water takes quite a lot of temperature to, to make into the atmosphere and all those sort of things, you could use the temperature from the data center to heat up this, the, the water. Therefore, you're using all the energy efficiently. You see, that, that's the point I'm trying to make. All right. So let's turn this on its head. So I live in uh, a large town. And... This large town requires energy, and that energy is made somewhere else. And let's just suppose it comes from hydroelectric power, and the hydroelectric power comes from the mountains. Yeah. So you're saying to me, perhaps, would a better system be that I don't live here, but I live up in the mountains? Sort of. The, the answer is you meet more closer to the hydroelectric dam, and so that don't have as much long transmission lines which of course then saves on the wiring and the copper and building the huge large pylons to connect everything it's so so if i lived in america for instance you might suggest i live out in one of the deserts it's useless land it, it, it can't grow anything because there's not enough water so what you do is you put lots of solar panels there and you build your city it's called las vegas isn't it yes that is absolutely right that is called Las Vegas. But that's not actually the, the point. You've got it all wrong. Yeah. It's it's not building your place where you can't live. It's a idea that let's build not a necessary town where there's power, because obviously, but let's build, you know, that's things like in a farmland farmland, let's take um Salt Lake City. Yeah. Right? They built their city in the middle of a salt lake. A salt lake. Who who would have guessed? But they've been regenerating the land to uh, all the farmland, you see, and then suddenly, but at the same time, you don't have large cities in Solar Punk. You see, you have very small communities, almost like villages, but lots of villages that are surrounded by farms. So you don't need to bring in all your produce, you, it's all local stuff, if that makes any sense. But then the power, of course, are oh, then you've got a field that in between the two villages, or, you know, the two farms and the villages, that then share the power that way so suddenly you're so it's not actually about large cities it's actually more about close-knit smaller communities that sort of they can re not relax they really rely on themselves that's the wrong way but are more inside that sustainable you know you think how much waste and pollution is caused by a lot of population and the answer is yeah you, know, you can if you do a smaller population you produce less yeah, but that does suggest getting rid of them. No, but I'm saying, but what if in a, we saw you sort of, let's say, you know, we've got a dense, but there's lots, lots of space. And, you know, I'm thinking America. America doesn't have that much. Um, it's still in the population of the world or a population of the country. It is very still sparse. And you have really dense places and really sparse places. And could you not make the dense place and the sparse space more equal all over the place. So therefore you're spreading the burden of the people living on the land across the whole country rather than just, you know, in these urban centers where the huge demand for stuff, where in the urban rural environments, they're sort of, you know, 
they haven't got anything because there's not you know there's no demand for this and so it's the you know in in the problem of you know this world of soda punk they envision not having you know capitalism gains you know there is no gains in the world it's only for the benefit of sort of making people's lives better and so do you need all your population in one place and to spread out when you can just well, work so, so let's ask a question why do we have cities and the answer is cities initially grew up towns grew up because in the uk because they were crossing places for bridges for instance and everyone who had to go across this river made their way down this road cross this little bridge usually paid for the privilege and by the way while you're here you could also pick up some bread and some veg and some other bits and pieces and that's where your trade started we also started putting cities on the coast and we put them where we could actually get ships in because that's where we were bringing in trade from other places i'll accept that we do some trade now via airports and we could put an airport nearly where you like it's got to have a bit of flat land i'll agree with that right so, so, so I'm, yeah I'm, I'm, and I'm so pretty... that that's how the system works at present but what now, I... you're trying to say to me now right okay now what we're going to do is we're going to abandon that system let's start again and we're going to spread everything out okay i see that but the farms that are producing aren't going to be producing all year round farms that i know tend to produce once maybe twice a year but and the rest of the time well they're just growing stuff but i say to you upon this we've discovered the best way to grow plants all year round is to use greenhouses right and then but at the same time of course you know you say well yeah but we can put them in greenhouses but greenhouses take a lot of money to make and build but you know you're you're, you're thinking sort of still not um utopian view you haven't got this utopian view you're still dragging us down back into reality no you need to think more utopian and then say how do i go from this point here in the now to that utopian view and i'm not saying we're going to demolish all the cities i'm not saying that at all all i'm saying is that a smaller community generally is able to sustain itself better so could we take the dense population and spread it wider you know almost take sort of the skyscraper late sideways you know but we put the skyscraper going up because we could get more population in a smaller footprint yes but at the same time of doing that are we sacrificing other things you know you sort of say you know the city the city doesn't grow any food anymore well of course it, you know there's, there's always been all the users but it's like um you know so why why are you living there can't you not you know we're talking about interconnected you know with the internet you, see, you don't need to be near everything you can sort of be further afield and still be a part of it with the in interconnectivity you know you don't need to travel that uh you know long commute you know you work you could work from home you see us all these extra ideas of being this utopian sort of society rather than just you know, where we're going from here and now it, it's not looking at you know pushing us forward you know you've got to mean that it's in balance of nature how much resources does a dense population use compared to a rural one and we're still sort of saying if you space it out and it's over the entire land as in let's take the, the size of, of america the whole country of america you make the you basically spread everywhere then the resources required for a person to live they can is much more uh not balanced but sort of more easier on the environment you're not having to build these huge landfills for a city when the amount of waste of a little small community isn't that great mm, i'm still not absolutely convinced here because uh you know, if you're going to start moving people out of somewhere, let's let's say America, where well, they've got a bit more space, I'm happy with that. But currently, a lot of that space is used for things like trees. So you'd then be chopping some of those trees down. All right, you could use the material, but 
your city's not going to, if you're going to take it from being up to now spreading it across, you're still not going to gain any more land. And I'm not saying to gain land. I'm not saying we can't go up. All I am saying purely is this idea that it's easier on the environment if less people live there. Because then, you know, you're, you're getting rid of people. Well, I'm not getting rid of people. This is the whole crux of the thing. It's more spreading it out over the entire land or the other the country where we you know. I'm not saying it is to then you basically are using per person less, I would say less resources, but you're putting less pressure on the environment. You know, you think how you've got all these you know, nice parks, but you think of the biodiversity in those parks. They're poor, whereas out in the wild, you know, they're uh, terrific. But sort of, if we sort of, you know, move the people, surely those biodiversity goes down. And it, it's, it's thinking of these things, you know, carefully and quietly and sort of, you know, saying that we've got greenhouses, they grow all year round. Why can't you not put your field under a nice greenhouse so then you can grow your field all year round as opposed to just having, you know, yes, I know there's time to grow the crop. I'm not saying you can't, you know, have time off to rotate it but i'm talking about you know do we need all that food you know can't we not make a you know every individual area feed for itself it, it is this idea of community as opposed to individualism i think yeah it, it's this as i said it's this utopian view and we're moving towards it you know you think of you know technologies like carbon capture reducing that climate down but they're using carbon capture, not just plonk it somewhere. We're actually reusing it. Yeah. So I saw some some um, crayons, for lack of a better word, uh, charcoal sort of crayons, and they're made from captured carbon. Yeah. Uh, so yeah, so you weren't going to make it in one form. You're actually using it from something else. Uh, they do cost more, of course uh and is that the other way of going sort of just saying well it's going to cost me more to sort of survive but that's worth it for a better planet and i'm in total agreement with that i don't mind paying a little bit more i don't like might paying a lot more but i don't mind paying a little bit more for something that's greener that's something that is sort of more ecologically sound something that doesn't affect the climate which basically affects me later on as well so i'm all for that but one of the critical points i'm about to make is you're saying but currently now the cost if in in theory if we are pursuing this why should the ecological version of a product cost more the answer is in theory that's where we want it so surely that should be the cheaper one i know it's a problem of currently you know they're making it you can make something quick and dirty and cheap as opposed to um you know we're talking about quality over quantity you know the idea that well instead of writing you know paper do we need paper anymore we've got all these tablets you know we can do all those sorts of things you can write on scribble on our screen and on phone and things and there's the information recorded instead of writing yeah all right and i'll agree that's going to send everything out electronically and i'm all in favor of that and i'm seriously thinking of doing that for my business but then it's actually using more energy now i've but, got my piece of paper yes it costs energy to make that piece of paper and i can store that and i can archive it and i can grab hold of it perhaps it's easier to get hold of the electronic version i can sort of search for it and i can find it that's going to be better but it's going to require more energy to actually do that one yeah but the idea of this is that more we have you know if it requires more energy then we have more solar panels but we've got to have ecologically friendly solar panels yeah you, know, you you're thinking sort of you know a plus b equals c you know we we're talking if it needs more power, you put more power in. Yeah, you know, we think of ways and power. You know, we're not stopping powering it. You're just going to make sure the powering is going to be eco-friendly and ecologically friendly. So, yeah, you know, if it requires, if, if having tablets and things is more ecologically friendly 
than the paper, then that's surely where we should be going, as opposed to have currently bleaching, re-bleaching this white uh, paper or you know, the, the pulp over and over again when we've got a computer screen on it. You know, that's the point I'm trying to make. Yeah. So you've been listening to the Going Green podcast. We've been talking about solar punk. Solar punk is sort of all about sharing. It's about community centricity for a big posh word. Let us know in the comments what you think about this. And we'll talk to you next time on Going Green. Until then, it's goodbye from me. And goodbye from me. Goodbye. Bye.